enjoying our <coughs> journey through Esther. And uh, you'll remember one of the things that we pointed out is, uh, nowhere in the book do we find God mentioned. Uh, he's totally out of the picture as far as being overtly present. And I think that's a good thing for us to recognize because it's often that way in our lives. Uh, we look around and we see situations, we see things uh, that, are, that happen, and we say, uh, maybe not verbally, but we think, well, where is God? Uh, if he loves me, if I'm part of his uh, family, uh, where is he in my life? Why do these things happen to me? Why doesn't he show up? Why doesn't he part the Red Sea anymore or show up in the burning bush, whatever it is that I need? But I think we've been able to see as we've looked at uh, Esther that God's invisible hand is there working, constantly moving things around, uh, orchestrating things in such a way to bring it all to the end that he has in mind. And you'll remember uh, we talked about uh, that quote from C.S. Lewis that says, Coincidence is merely God's way of remaining anonymous. And that's, that's good to remember because we talk about coincidences and we coincidentally did this or ran into that person or whatever. Uh, but that's God's way of remaining anonymous. And so this morning our story progresses. And last week we were in chapter 6, this week will be 7. Now you may recall that we, we said that chapter 6 was, could be a case study in uh, what Paul tells us in Romans, uh, chapter 8 verse 28, that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. And we talked a little bit about that and I, I uh, encourage you to note when you read that verse that it says God causes all things to work together for our good. Good things, bad things, and different things, he still causes them to work for our good. Sometimes we read that and, and we kind of do some mental gymnastics and come up with God causes all good things to work together for our good. And that's not what it says. Um, so we need to take note. Well, if that's true of chapter 6, chapter 7 could be a case study in God's sovereignty and our responsibility. There's a, two things that often cause us a, a, a bit of consternation. You know, if, if God is sovereign, if God's running the show, if God's already got it all figured out, it's all going to work out to his end, well then, what part do I play in that? Why am I in this? What does it matter uh, if I do whatever it is I do? It's an age-old question that Christians have uh, wrestled with. And today in chapter 7, we're, we're really going to see how uh, Esther balances that uh, tension between God's sovereignty and her responsibility. You know, how do we reconcile uh, scriptures like uh, Daniel 4.35 with scriptures like Ephesians 2.10? And I'll read Daniel 4.35 for you. It says this, All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and God does according to his will, according to the host of heaven, and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, What have you done? Paraphrasing, God does what he wants to do, when he wants to do it, how he wants to do it. Okay. But then, Paul tells us in Ephesians 2.10 that we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he planned beforehand. Oh, okay. So God does everything, but we're supposed to do something. How do we balance those two? Well, I hope we can uh, answer that as we go along this morning. Now, there are two extremes that we could come to, but as in most everything, the extremes are wrong. Now, one extreme would fall into the Daniel camp, and we'll just say, well, just let go and let God. I need a job, so I'll just sit here on the couch until the phone rings. Yeah. And then there's the other camp, it goes to the other extreme, and their, their, their motto might be, well, if it's going to be, it's up to me. And if I don't do my part, God's plan somehow is going to fail. 
Now we, we can pretty well, I think, agree that both of those extremes are wrong. And the truth, as is often the case, lies somewhere in the middle. God has a plan, and we are a part of that plan. If we were not a part of that plan, he would not have died for us. He would not have reached down from his heaven and called us into his kingdom. Because as we, as we look at that, that Ephesian pas passage, you know, that was verse 10, but 8 and 9, By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay? That's what he did. Now he says, therefore, let's be about doing the good works which he planned for us beforehand. There's a, a synergism in these verses such as Daniel and Ephesians. And normally when we talk about theology, uh, synergism is bad. We don't like synergism because synergism is, you know, bringing two things together and we're often talking about bringing something into our theology that shouldn't be there. But here a little synergism is a good thing and I think we can see it well done in Philippians chapter 2 verses 12 and 13. Paul says this, Therefore, my beloved, now, whenever you see therefore, he, he's referring to something that came beforehand. And what came beforehand here is, is this section where it talks about how Jesus came and humbled himself and died on a cross for us, etc. So, therefore, my beloved, because Jesus has done all these things, as you have always obeyed now, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence. Now, here it is. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Okay, that's the Ephesians part. Work out your salvation. In other words, you need to do something. It doesn't say work for your salvation. It says work it out. In other words, live it out. Work out your salvation. Now here's the other part, the other side of the equation. For it is God. It is God who works in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. I, and I think that's probably one of the best pieces of Scripture to bring the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man together. You get busy doing some things because God is doing some things in you so that you can do those things. And it's a great uh, synergistic relationship. So let's look at, at chapter 7 and, and see how this all plays out. We have two plans, two competing plans, don't we? Haman has a plan, and Esther has a plan. Haman's plan is to destroy the Jews because Mordecai disrespected him, wouldn't bow down to him, wouldn't appreciate who he is, and so he's going to destroy all of the Jews. As our story opens today, it seems his plan is getting back on track. You remember, he's had some ups and downs here. Uh, but uh, let, let's back up to the last verse in chapter 6. While they were yet talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried to bring Haman to the feast that Esther had prepared. Okay, now he was humiliated in the last chapter by having to uh, parade Mordecai through town and all that sort of thing. And he was really down in the dumps. But now things are looking up because once again, he is invited to this exclusive dinner with the king and the queen. Okay, he says, I, I, I had a rough couple of weeks. Uh, things didn't go my way, but, but now they're back on track. Now I'll have the king's ear once again, and I can begin to implement my plan. Haman had all the power, he had or all the money, he had all the influence. How could his plan possibly fail? And, and if you were to look and all of the evidence, it pointed to Haman's success. See? Everything that you could see here in this situation with your human eyes pointed to the fact that Haman was going to be successful in carrying out his plan to destroy the Jews. And you might ask that question, well, where's God? He's going to let his people be destroyed. And that would be a logical conclusion if you looked only at the empirical evidence. 
But we don't look only at the empirical evidence, do we? As Christians, as the righteous, we live by what? Faith. Faith. Yeah. So we're going to look beyond the physical evidence. Because Esther also had a plan. As queen, uh, she at least had the king's ear, but any real influence was based solely upon the king's capricious disposition towards her. You remember she recognized that when Mordecai asked her to go to the king. You remember she told Mordecai, she said, I can't go to the king. I'm not his number one favorite anymore. He hasn't called for me for, for 30 days and all those sorts of things. So uh, it totally depended on uh, how he was feeling that day. She's in a tight spot. You remember Vashti? You remember Vashti was queen? The king loved Vashti. The king thought Vashti was so beautiful. He wanted her to come so he could show her off to all of his, uh, his buddies. And what did she do? She embarrassed the king by saying no. So what happened to her? Well, you'll notice she's not the queen anymore. She's gone. So now Esther's the queen. And she's in this same position. Because what she has been asked to do is to go to the king and ask him to rescind his decree. And you remember early on in chapter 1, we learned that uh, in Persia at that time, when the king made a decree, it was irrevocable. Even the king himself couldn't pull it back. Now she's going to go and she's going to ask him to somehow rescind this decree, something that had never been done before, and it's going to make him look rather foolish. Wow. You know, the people are already talking about him. Now, you'll remember at, at the end of chapter 3, it was noted that his decree that he had given had thrown the whole country into confusion. And the people are talking, you know, what's, what's the matter with the king? What's he doing now? This is going to cause us all kinds of problems. And, and, and then we saw that he had Haman parade Mordecai through the streets, praising Mordecai. And, and now the people are really confused because Haman's supposed to be the number one guy, the king's right-hand man. And the king's got him he parading this Jew through town. Uh, what's the king smoking? You know, <laughs> there's something wrong here. And now, this decree that you remember went out to all the provinces, not just Persian proper, but to all the provinces of the whole kingdom. And now Esther's going to ask him to change it. Then people, what are people going to think then? She's in a spot. Two plans. Notice the genesis of these two plans, the beginning of these two plans. Haman's plan began with jealousy and hatred. He's ha he hates Haman. Therefore, by extension, he hates the Jews, or he hates Mordecai. So by extension, he hates the Jews. And so out of this hatred, and this self-serving purpose, he devises a plan. Now Esther's plan, Esther's plan has its genesis in prayer. You remember, she told Mordecai, she said, you go back, when she finally acquiesced to go to the king, but before we do, she says, you go back and you have all the people pray for three days, and I and my uh, little circle of friends, we will also pray for three days, and then I'll do something. Different roots, aren't they? And of course, the roots are what produce the plant, right? Haman's plan is rooted in hatred. Esther's plan is rooted in prayer. Now, when you go to God in prayer, what you're saying is the opposite of what Haman was saying. You're saying, Lord, 
I need to know what you want me to do. You may even have, already have an idea. That's, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. And you may say, Lord, this is what I'm thinking I want to do. What do you think? And then you listen. And you see what he has to say. Now I want you to notice that prayer is immediately followed by action. See, we talked about, you know, folks that say, well, uh, I, just, I need to pray about this. Well, that's good. That's a good spiritual uh, way to approach things. But you don't need to pray about it for ten years. You know, nowhere in the New Testament do we see that. You know, I, I would challenge you to read the prayers in the New Testament. They're all short, sweet, and to the point. And then they go and do something. And so it is here with Esther. She prays for three days, and then she gets up in, in chapter 5, verse 1, and she puts on her royal robes, and she goes into the inner court of the king's palace. So, when we pray, and when we plan, it's for a purpose. And we should implement that plan. But now notice also, that her actions are not presumptuous. She dresses properly for the occasion. She doesn't just barge in and say, here I am. She waits in the outer court until the proper time, and then she approached the king. She had a plan, and she worked that plan. She didn't impetuously just barge in there and say, hey, king, I prayed about this, and God told me to tell you you ever, you ever have Christians do that to you? Well, God told me to tell you, well, you're kind of in a bad spot because how could you argue with God? God already told him this thing, you know. So, she doesn't do that. She has a plan. I was uh, raised in a denomination that wasn't big on planning. And they were, they were all about the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's cool, you know. It's part of the Godhead equal with the Father and the Son. Uh, but uh, they, they would, they love to go to places like Luke 12, 11, and 12. And, and you guys have heard this, I'm sure, when, when they're talking about planning, okay? And they'd say, well, it says here that when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about what you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. And they'd say, see, we don't need to plan. We, we don't need to, to work. Uh, the Holy Spirit will tell us. Well, I heard plenty of sermons that were prepared on that premise. <laughs> and if you think I'm boring, you should have heard some of those. Or some of them were very lively, but they were pretty vacuous in their content. So, as Christians, we're called to plan, we're called to pray, but we're also called to prepare. And then implement things in the, within the proper structure that we have to work with. And that's exactly what Esther did. So we're going to see now that her planning and her patience are about to pay off. Verse 2. And on the second day, as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king again said to Esther, What is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted to you. And what is your request? Even to half of the kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. Can you imagine? Now, think about this. Esther has the responsibility of saying, saving an entire race of people. How anxious she must be to tell the king what she wants. But she keeps quiet. She gives God time to work. And pretty soon now the king takes the initiative. And he says, Esther, what is it you want? Do you see how God is working here? It's very subtle. It's very silent. But he is working. Verse 3 and 4. The Queen Esther answered, 
If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be granted me for my wish and my people, for my request, for we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent. But our affliction is not to be compared with the loss of the king. Wow. Esther now links her fate with God's people. Now, up until now, the king had no idea. Now, we saw that earlier on, a few in the harem knew, but no one would dare tell the king, because, you know, where we get that old saying, don't shoot the messenger, because the kings would do that in those days. If you brought them uh, news they didn't like, off with your head. So nobody's going to bring the king news he doesn't like. So he, didn't, he still didn't know. Now he knows that Esther is a Jew. The king now asks, who? Who did this? Well, you've got to think, well, where was the king when Haman laid this plan out for him and asked him to, to uh, give it his blessing? Well, it meant so little to him that he didn't bother to find out. He didn't bother to find out that Haman wanted to kill all these people. He just said, okay, fine, you want to kill a few people? Go ahead. It's no big deal. So the king asked who? Now here's, here's an interesting thing. The heretofore soft-spoken, quiet, patient Queen Esther says, a foe and an enemy, this wicked Haman. She didn't mince any words. You see, there's a time to speak up, too. God has given us a brain, and we're to use it. There's, there's a time to just confront evil and call it what it is. But we need to be discerning about when that time is. And so she, she nails it. She says, it's Haman. Well, poor Haman. If you didn't dislike him so much by now, you'd have to feel sorry for him. I mean, his, his life's a real roller coaster, isn't it? King loves him, king hates him, king loves him. Now, now the, the queen has called him out. So let's see how the king responds. And the king arose in his wrath from the wine drinking and went into the palace garden. Okay, he takes a walk. Why did the king go outside and take a walk? Well, I think a couple of reasons. First, the obvious reason was not because he was so enraged about Haman, though he was, but he now realizes the spot he's in and he's going out to try to figure out how he can save face. Because remember, Haman's his man. And so, what's he going to do? How is he going to get rid of Haman without again looking like he's flip-flopped on things? Now, the not-so-obvious reason is the invisible hand of God. God moved him out of the room in order to set up a coincidence. And we see in verse 8, and the king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. And the king said, Will he even assault the queen in my presence in my house? As the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's head. You see, there's some, there's some, the king went out, the king comes back in just in time to see Haman falling at Esther's, in Esther's lap, and the king says, ah, here's my excuse, I can get rid of Haman for assaulting the queen, and it doesn't have anything to do with my policy shifts, and my flip-flops, he assaulted the queen. You see how God set that up? Haman's plan is rooted in hatred. 
Hatred always brings about death. And in this instance, it's going to bring about Haman's death. They covered his head. Now, it doesn't tell us why they covered his head, but if we, if we understand the times, that was the general procedure. When the king said, you're through, they immediately covered the person's head, and they didn't get to see anything anymore. But we also see some irony here. Haman is on his knees before a Jew. What brought this whole thing about? It was the fact that the Jew wouldn't bow to Haman, and now Haman is bowing to the Jew. Different Jew, with Mordecai that wouldn't bow to Haman, but he's still a Jew. And now, here we have Haman throwing himself at the feet of Esther. Well, he will now reap exactly what he sowed. Then Harbana, one of the eunuchs in attendance of the king, said, Moreover, the gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king, is standing at Haman's house 50 cubits high. And the king said, Hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows and that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the wrath of the king abated. Another irony, isn't it? Haman is hung on the very gallows he had built specifically for Mordecai. Two plans, two completely different outcomes. Well, what do we learn from chapter 7? I, I would suggest three things. One, God has a plan for each of us and is continually working to bring that plan about regardless of what the circumstances may look like. You know, Jeremiah says it in uh, chapter 29, verse 11, God speaking, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Okay? We don't know, but God does. And if God says his plan for us is good, it is good. Second, we have a responsibility to do the good works that God has planned for us. We have a responsibility to equip ourselves. Every once in a while, people say things like, well, I know Jesus, what more do I need to know? Well, you need to know everything you can possibly know. You need to equip yourself to do the good works that God has planned. Third, and this is probably the biggest one. A godly plan always involves prayer. Now you can plan first and then pray about it. You can pray and then plan. doesn't really matter. But you have to involve prayer in it. You don't have to pray forever. You can be short and succinct about it. But you have to pray with an open heart and an open mind. Conversely, an ungodly plan always begins with me. I'm going to develop this plan because I have had my feelings hurt. I have been disrespected. I have been taken advantage of. I have, I have, I have, I have. So if you want to know if you're planning something and, and you, you just want a baseline measure for is this something God's going to be involved with or is this just me, just ask yourself, does the plan begin with you and, and some grievance you've suffered? Or does your plan begin with God or with serving someone else? God calls us to serve others, not to serve South. I was talking to somebody the other day about uh, marriage counseling and they were just asking me that they, they're not a Christian and they were just have a, have what pastors do you know and well part of it's marriage counseling oh I'll bet that's interesting no I don't like it but <laughs> she, she so we, we kept talking about it and I told her I said well normally what happens in marriage counseling is this couple comes in and her goal is for him to change and his goal is for her to change. And nobody wants to change themselves. You see? And it doesn't work. 
until you get to the place where, okay, I want to change what's wrong with me, then there's some good can come about it. So a godly plan begins with prayer. An ungodly plan begins with self. Finally, though, what I want to leave us with is a broader truth from the whole New Testament. Unlike Esther, we never have to wonder if we are going to be acceptable before our king. Now that's good news. We never have to wonder if our king is going to extend the scepter to us, so to speak, and say welcome. See? And I'll just give you three pieces of scripture, just quickly. Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28. Jesus says, Come unto me, all of you who are doing just fine and don't need anything. <laughs> no, he didn't, did he? Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You see? In John, Jesus says it this way. All that the Father gives to me will come to me. Okay, that's, we're good with that. And whosoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Again, we don't have to worry about when he will cast us out, when he'll get fed up with us, when he'll get tired of us repeating the same foolish mistakes over and over again, because he says, never. And then one of my favorites is Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Now, get this part. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now, here's the best part. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. New American Standard says that we can come boldly into his presence. I like that. You didn't dare enter the Persian king's presence. You'd lose your head. But we can come boldly because he has been tempted in all things like is we. So he's never going to turn us down. He's never going to say, no, you've sinned too much. No, you're too bad. No, you're too stupid. No, you're too whatever. He's going to give us grace and he's going to give us mercy according to the need of the moment. And I'll tell you, boy, that's what I need. And that's why I'm a Christian. Because God so loved you and I that he literally died for us that we will never have to pay the penalty of our sins. That's huge. So I would just say to you here today, I mean, we all wonder sometimes what's going on. Well, God's going on. And that's, that's what we need to know. And then we do our best. And if you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, now is the time to do that. I'm going to pray in just a minute and all you need to do is just in, in the quietness of your heart say, I need you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. Because I've sinned. Maybe you've sinned big and horrendous. Maybe you've sinned very little. But we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And if you do that, your future is guaranteed forever because he will never cast you out. That's good news. Pray with me, please. Lord Jesus, thank you that you love us like you do. Thank you, Lord, that you are constantly working in our lives and in the lives of others. And Lord, thank you that you are a, a God that is real. That you tell us in your, your word that in this world we'll have trouble and problems and trials and all kinds of things, but we can be of good cheer because you have overcome this world and one day we will step into eternity to be with you. And so until then, Lord, help us to be about your business. Help us to be about doing the good works you've planned for us. And Lord, if anyone in here this morning has uh, made a commitment to you, Lord, thank you for that. And just let them know that 
anyone here would be glad to help them. I will be glad to help them. And together we can move forward in your kingdom, watching your glorious plan unfold. We ask now that you bless our week. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.